sort of brought him full circle. And, and as, he's, as he's looking at that, I, I think you will also notice some things that might pertain to your life and your relationship with God as well. The uh, book of Psalms is about, about the center of your Bible, and 139 is almost to the end. There's 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms, so uh, if you find 139, you might want to even leave a uh, bookmark there and go back and read this later. It's just a beautiful way to connect to who God is. And when I put it that way, it just dawned on me. I want us to look at that as well. I don't want you to consider who God is. I want you to consider who God is to you. He writes, he said, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Think about that. Your friends, your family, the people that you associate with at work, the ones who like you. Do you ever wonder, would they like me if they knew everything about me? But God does. He knows everything about you. Even the lies you tell yourself, He knows aren't true. You are totally, completely known by God, and He still loves you. Amen. You know me, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You are not a stranger to God, guys. No way, shape, or form. The good things about you, the bad things about you, God already knows. And He's known you before you did. Now, when the 1960s ended, San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district, it reverted to high rent. And a lot of the hippies moved down the coast to Santa Cruz. You remember the hippie movement? Maybe some of you were part of it, right? I'm a little young for that, but I have older brothers and sisters, and, and I remember the, the guys. I remember one of my brothers or sisters' friends. I thought he was the coolest thing because he had these purple bell bottoms. <laughs> and he would come with them on. And, you know, so I got to see some really interesting people come in and out of the house and such like that. And um, I always liked it because they would always leave like pizza and uh, good junk food afterwards. I didn't know it was because they were so smoked up they had the munchies and you know as a four or five year old there was just always good food for me to come across after I didn't notice they slept a lot and, at, uh, and I was really exposed to some wonderful music I got to hear real good music as a kid um, but anyway back back to these people <laughs> well the hippies moved down to Santa Cruz and they had children and they got married Sometimes in that sequence, sometimes not. And, um, but the cool thing was they didn't name their children Melissa or Brett. They, they grew accustomed to children playing and they had names like Little Time Warp and Spring Fever and Apple Blossom and things like that. And eventually Moonbeam, Earth Love and Precious Promise, they all ended up in the public schools. And that's when the kindergartners first met Fruit Stand. 
Every fall, according to tradition, parents bravely apply name tags to their children and kiss them goodbye and send them off on a school bus. And that was what it was like for Fruit Stand. The teachers thought the little boy's name was odd, but they tried to make the best of it. Would you like to play with the blocks, Fruit Stand? They offered. And later, Fruit Stand, how about a snack? And he hesitantly accepted. And at the end of his day, you know, and his name didn't seem much different than Moonbeam or Sunrays. So in dismissal time, the teachers led the children out to the buses, and they said, Fruit Stand, do you know which one is your bus? And he didn't answer. In fact, he hadn't spoken all day. But that wasn't strange. I mean, first day of school, right? Lots of children were shy. It didn't matter. And the teachers had instructed the parents to write the names of their children's bus stop on the reverse side of their name tag. So the teacher just flipped the tag over. And when she flipped it over, there neatly printed was the word Anthony. <laughs> sometimes society knows you, sometimes they don't, right? But it's a totally different story when it comes to God. Because He knows you with no exceptions. He knows everything about everyone with no exceptions. Even those who don't know Him, the, the ISIS terrorists, the, the most ardent atheists, and the most beloved saint, He knows equally. None of them are outside the knowledge of our loving God. Amen. I'm not a big fan of the, of the message Bible, and I don't recommend anyone use it as their only Bible. But I do like to skim through it sometimes as part of studying with the King James and with the NIV. But I love this part, Psalm 139, 13 and 16 in the message. It reads like this. It says, oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I lived even one day. Even when the world may not know who we are, they can't identify us with or without a name tag. God knows us. He knows everything about us. And sometimes there are those who like to think that when it comes to the things of God and of the spiritual nature, that we have this secret identity that God is on a need-to-know basis. Did you ever not tell somebody something they wanted to know? Working in the security field, I, I have a lot of individuals who, who ask questions about things in the facility that have nothing to do with them. And they get upset when I won't tell them. I'll tell them, that's, I'm sorry, that's not an issue for your job description. And they get very upset. I want to know, why can't you tell me? And I'll try to find nice ways of saying, because it's none of your business. That's what I really want to say, but I don't. You know. With God, there is nothing we can keep from Him. Everything is His business because we are His. Amen. And if we don't acknowledge Him, then He doesn't become and isn't involved on our daily basis. We fail to realize that God's great handiwork is in every breath we take. And in every moment we live, we can lie to ourselves that God doesn't know about it. We can lie to ourselves and say that God has nothing to do with this. But that's all it is, is a lie. 7 and 12 in the message goes like this. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. I was calling my dog one day up in the mountains and, and he had run into the woods and I was calling him and he, he knew what he wanted, it was time to come home and he didn't want to go home. So he hid from me. Now most of you know Sherman, right? Sherman's an English setter, he's about 60 pounds. Well he was trying to hide behind a tree this big around. <laughs> he's standing real still, he had his head behind there, when he looked all he saw was the tree. I see his big butt sticking out there, you know, it's like, Sherman, I know you're there. Are funny. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute because you're already there waiting. 
Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in his light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. We like to think that we, it's all about us, don't we? That we're the universe and the world revolves around us. In fact, that's what scientists taught to Copernicus. In fact, in, in, the, in the church, was, well, they, almost, they almost put him to death for saying that everything didn't revolve around the earth. The earth was at the center of the universe. In reality, we're just participants. We are participants in a universe that was created for us by the Almighty God, the maker of everything in it. And we get so busy oftentimes just doing our own thing. We live our own life. We lose sight of the reason why we were created in the first place. And it may come as a shock to some of you this morning, but we were created for one expressed purpose, to worship God. Amen. Revelation 4.11 in the King James reads like this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, now catch this part, Revelation 4.11, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. There you have it. We were created for God's pleasure. We were created to have an intimate and loving relationship with our Creator. I heard parents arguing with their child one day, and a bratty little kid, he said, I wish I had never been born. And they looked at him and said, yeah, we do too. And he was completely stunned by that. Wow. <laughs> And I was glad they said that, because then he started to get the idea. But David caught this at an early age, that we have that intimate, loving relationship with our Creator as the reason for our existence. Amen. He was called and he was anointed as a young boy to be the king of Israel. But his relationship didn't begin at that point. You see, he already had a close and personal relationship with God. And that's why in the story of David and Goliath, which will, was one of my favorite stories when I was five years old, and now when I'm 54, it is still one of my favorite stories. Amen. He was aware of the strengths and abilities that God had given him, but he was also acutely aware of the source of those, strength, of those abilities and that strength. He knew where it came from, and he even said that in 1 Samuel 17. He says this, he said, Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. This is the best smack talk that has ever existed. <laughs> and I will strike you, and I will take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And this guy is sitting there, what was he, nine feet tall, something like that? Yep. You know, and he's got, he's an accomplished warrior, he's killed hundreds of men, he's lived his entire life as a bully, he has you know, intimidated people all of his life, and this shepherd boy is telling him what he's going to do to him. Now, whenever you have somebody who is so extremely confident, it does shake you up a little bit. It's like, well, wait a minute, maybe there really is something about him. Believe me, the worst man to fight is a crazy man. Actually, it's a crazy woman, it's the worst thing to fight. But, uh, <laughs> that got a lot of response, huh? Some people have experience. But uh, it's, it's, the, it's the crazy that you just can't be hurt, that they don't care. It's really difficult to restrain somebody who is... Um, who is on drugs or somebody who is, has had something going on and in some way is out of their mind because they don't feel pain. They have so much adrenaline going through their body that they're actually stronger. But also there's something, in, something that shuts off in them and they're just not able, they just don't care if they hurt you. And those are the dangerous people to encounter. And I wonder if that crossed Goliath's mind. For this kid to be talking all of this smack he must have something going on. What is it? Now, 
Goliath being a Philistine, he was probably thinking more along the lines of, well, he must be really good with that sling. But that wasn't David's strength. The strength was the God that he was telling him. Now, had Goliath listened to David, he would have understood that. Because he goes on and he says, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord. So David say, it's already been won. You don't understand. You're just simply going along with this plan at this point. Amen. He will give you into our hands. He knew from a young age that all the battles were already the Lord's. The Lord had helped him overcome a lion and a bear. He had been victorious over, over both. I know we have a lot of hunters out here. Anybody here ever shoot a bear? I, I never shot a bear either. But I've had them on my back porch. Now, you know, I've had squirrels and we even had a coyote once. We've had a lot of possum, a lot of raccoons, even a skunk now and again. We're afraid of them for a different reason. But man, when I looked out that door and I saw that bear standing there about five feet from the screen, oh, that was interesting. And he was just a young one. He was only six foot tall and 300 pounds. Wow. And to think this David would have fought one of them with his bare hands. One of the things they tell us, you know, when you're hunting bear, is when you shoot one, make sure you kill it. <laughs> Don't let it get close to you before you shoot it. Shoot it so that you still have time to get a second or third round off, because once it's wounded, it's coming at you. This was with his bare hands. He killed this. I'm sure it maybe is a knife or a sling or something, but, you know. I mean, I, I use a big gun when I go bear hunting. I don't even want the standard deer rifle. I want something big. Certainly not a stone. But God, and a lion, forget that. I mean, the lion's hunting you, and you're, uh, and you're fighting back against that. Again, with a, with a, a spear maybe, with a, a handheld weapon. But David, he was willing to acknowledge and not just acknowledge, but to have God be a major part of everything in his world. He got that God already was in control of what was going on with him. If we look again at the message version of Psalm 139, it says, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you, even from a distance. You know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. Let's back up right. You know what I'm thinking. Have you ever had a discussion with your spouse and she'll say that to you or he'll say, I know what you're thinking. Well, the woman's usually right. We're always wrong. We know that. Amen. I get an amen. That's the first amen this whole sermon. But, uh, oh, that's quite good. Thank you. Thank you. But the, he knows your thoughts. Imagine that. You don't hide anything from him. I mean, we don't always tell everybody what's on our minds. We know sometimes when somebody's lying to us and we let them go on. Or sometimes we're lying to somebody else and we get away with it. Sometimes it's just to avoid hurting their feelings or something like that. I'm not talking about some dark purpose. But, you know, there, there's a reason why our thoughts don't appear in bubbles over our heads. Because we would all be alone if they did, right? But God already knows. And that's the beauty of having a prayer life. Because it enables you to talk to the one individual who knows everything about you. You can be 100% honest with him. Because he already knows anyway. And the ability to get that off of your chest is priceless. To just open up and say, God, search me. And oh, man, here, you are, here I am. He goes on and he says, you know when I leave, when I get back, I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there, then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. It is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Think about that. God is just so much that we can't take it all in. David's life was an open book. 
to the eyes of God. And everything that God had to offer, David wanted to be a part of. He worshipped him in private. He worshipped him in a public square in front of the whole kingdom. 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 16, it says, Now David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. But those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps. He sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. While wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. That's a whole other story. But uh, David had no inhibitions about the way he worshipped the Lord. He worshiped the Lord with all his heart, even if it embarrassed his wife. And us guys, we know what it's like to embarrass our wife, right? Yep. We've, we're pretty good at that, right? He didn't care what people thought. He didn't care if he was politically correct. He only cared about being correct in his walk with God. Amen. He danced before the Lord. I don't know about you, but as for myself... I have a few inhibitions about dancing in private, let alone on the public square in front of everyone to see. As singing is not my gift, neither is dancing, guys. <laughs> I'm just not real good at it. But yet David danced before the Lord. And I don't think it was one of those, you know, the junior high, this little swaying thing. It's a death dance, how I still dance. But uh, it's, uh, <laughs> this was beautifully orchestrated. He danced before the Eternal One with everything he had. He didn't care what anyone else thought. He was all about worshiping God. And if everyone else worshiped God with all their might, they wouldn't care about anything else either. Amen. As for his effort, God's divine favor was an everyday part of David's life. For that, David said, God, God said that David was a man after his own heart. Now, in the end, aren't those the words we all want to hear? When we stand before the Lord, when we go before our Maker? It's impossible for you to have the divine favor, to have the favor of God in your life if you don't know God. So, I encourage you to take your Christianity, to take your walk with God, maybe a little more out of your head and a little more into your hearts today. Amen. Amen. Quit thinking so much about God and start living for God. Amen. Do like David did. Get to know and worship God with every fiber of your being. If you want to come here next Sunday and all of us dance for 20 minutes, we'll do it. Amen. I'll be there. You'll be, yeah. Uh, you can, you, you would need your help a lot if you got through that, okay? But mean it. Worship God from the depths of your heart, the one who already knows everything about you. Because when we live to know God's ways, to know God more, He pours out His favor in our lives. And it's all through the relationship that we have now through His Son, Jesus. We read earlier, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. If God is not present in our lives, we are not pleasing Him. How do we live to please God? I'm so glad you asked that, because now I get to go on. <laughs> One is we please God by loving Him. Amen. Matthew 22, 37 and 38, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Our first priority is to love God with every fiber of our being. We are called to love God supremely. Nothing comes before God in our lives. He desires to have the first and foremost place in our lives. I say, well, I thought I was supposed to love my spouse for no. 
You can't love your spouse if you don't love God. Anyone who doesn't know God doesn't know what love is. So a, a non-Christian tells another person that they love them, they're lying to them. Maybe not intentionally. They might think they love them. But if they don't know God, they're incapable of knowing love. They might feel some fond feelings toward them. But true love only comes from God. Amen. Society nowadays, it will tell us it's okay to worship any religion. It's just God by every other name. Eventually, they're going to all lead to the same God, even though they might have different names. But this is what the Bible says. God is a jealous God. God's Word translation puts it this way. Never worship any other God because the Lord is a God who does not tolerate rivals. In fact, he's not... He is known for not tolerating rivals. And two, we please God in believing in Him. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And David certainly had faith in God. He would have never been able to do all the things that he did if he didn't have faith in God. We talk a lot about David and Goliath because that was David's introduction to us, if you will. It was a great big deal. It was... You know, took down the gen But, you know, there's other occasions. He went out and he killed 200 Philistines. I I'm sorry, I'll take on one guy, I don't care how big he is, before I'll take on 200 little guys. Incredible feats that he performed. He did all of this because he had faith in God. He couldn't have done any of them without his faith. And you and I are no different. We will never be able to do the things that God calls upon us to do if we don't have faith in God that He is able to accomplish it. There's no way we'll ever be able to please God if we don't believe in Him and what He can do. We place our faith in God when we trust Him completely. And when God comes first in our lives, when we love God more than we love anyone else, that makes us a better wife, a better husband, a better son, a better daughter. Trust God completely, and this is important. Even when life doesn't make sense, there's a lot of that. Even when it seems like there's no way out. When everyone else is telling us to give up. Even when our healing seems so far away and our body says there's no way. Even, even when we think we can handle it on our own. You can't listen to anyone but God, yourself included. If you're ever going to see your miracle come to pass, God's going to do that, not you. When life seems senseless, that's when it's most important to trust God. Amen. And thirdly, we please God, and none of us like this one. We please God by obeying Him. Mm. John 15, 14 says, You are my friends if you keep on doing the things which I command you to do. What did Jesus say the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind. And, and what else? There you go. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you guys are good. You must have a good pastor. Too. <laughs> Jesus also told his disciples they become friends with God through obedience. I guess the easiest way to put it is our obedience determines the depth of our relationship with God. He even says obedience is better than sacrifice. Think about that. But number four, we please God by praising Him. Just as David saw, God saw the way David worshipped Him. He sees the way we worship Him. If you think He doesn't, you're very mistaken. The Bible says he inhabits your praise. So believe me, he is quite aware of how you worship him. David was uninhibited in the way he worshiped. He worshiped and he praised God. But remember, he was a man after God's own heart. Are you concerned with how your peers might view you if you worship God with all your heart? Does the way we feel about how we are seen or perceived affect the way we praise God? Shouldn't we be more concerned with how God sees us than the way we're worried that our fellow man would see us? 
I was watching uh, previews for a TV show. I'm not even sure what show it was. But the father said to the little girl, you know, you're going to be like all those other people. You're going to, you'll be an idiot. And she jumps up and she says, but I want to be an idiot so bad. Sometimes we want to be long so much that we, we sacrifice our obedience to God. We're so concerned with how people see us that we forget it's more important how God sees us. Guys, go back to Genesis chapter 3. What did Satan say to Eve? You will not surely die. God is afraid you will become like him. Don't fall for the lies of Satan. That's Satan's real voice, by the way. <laughs> we need to be more concerned with how God sees us. Our concern must be in pleasing God, not pleasing men. That's why when you come to church, you'll hear us say, don't be inhibited in your praise. As far as we're concerned, there's an audience of one that's watching you. That's the one you have to be concerned about. If there is ever a time in your life to have tunnel vision, it's when you're praising. Absolutely. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the heavens of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to the abundance of His greatness. God deserves our praise for every single blessing that he's given us. We, we deserve nothing from God. Zero. So every little thing he gives us is grace. He owes us absolutely nothing. And when bad things happen in our lives, our praise should be, God, thank you for not giving me more bad things to deal with. Right. Your praise, it's your opportunity for thanking and returning blessing back for everything that he does for you. And it's a shame that a lot of people don't think praise and worship is important in our lives. What they fail to realize is that praise and worship is incentive-based. Mm. What do I mean by that? Mm. Mm -hmm. The more you praise, the more you worship, the more you believe and trust and have faith in the God of all possibilities, the more He releases the amazing blessings that He has for you in your life. Amen. That's why we take time each and every worship service for praise and worship. So if everyone has a, has a chance to take time to thank God for how good He's been to them. And then come the distractions, right? My phone has buzzed twice in my pocket since I got up here today. Probably a few of you have had it too. Distract, distractions are always abundant, but we should never let them affect our focus on Jesus Christ, our praise and our worship. And our last and fifth point, now that's when everybody wakes up, right? <laughs> we please God by serving Him. God wants you to live out your life serving Him. Not just showing up on Sunday morning. I certainly appreciate you showing up on Sunday morning. But you're not showing up here for me. If you are, please click on it. You are showing up to worship God. True service, though, is lived out each and every day of your life, in every area, in every aspect of your life. Amen. And if you're not finding an opportunity to praise God on a daily basis, to be a servant to God and your fellow man, to be the hands and feet of God in this world, you're missing the opportunities that God has and wants to bless you with. The opportunities are abundant if you have a servant's heart. If you're willing to act when you see one, and it can be little things, guys. You see somebody looking down and upset. Catch their eye and smile at them. They might ignore you and walk on by, but they saw it. A little bit of encouragement. A little bit of help. You're behind the guy in, in line and, and he's a dollar short. And instead of complaining that you have to wait for somebody to bring a key, you know, they always, you know he's got the key. Instead, you know, throw a buck on there. Help somebody else out next time. Amen. That's being, that's serving God. That's not serving the person in front of you. You don't know who they are. You may never see them again in your life. But you're serving God. Think of our sister Kim praying with the police officers. How much that means to those guys. Put their lives on the line each and every day for us. For a very ungrateful, demanding public. And she takes the time to pray. Opportunities like that, they're very abundant. 
When we see those opportunities to serve our fellow man, we're expected to do that because what is the greatest commandment? Love God. What's the second greatest commandment? Love, love your neighbor. Part of our faith, part of our obedience, our diligence in seeking Him is in serving others. And when we do those things, His blessings are automatic. In Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You see, the more we seek and the more we follow God, well, the more we see His promises being kept to us. Book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have asked. For you have, excuse me, for you have found favor, loving kindness, and mercy in my sight. And I know you personally and by name. Mm. Think about that. That's the kind of relationship. Of course, we all say we want that relationship with God. But I don't want this to be a secret. God wants to have that relationship with you. Amen. He longs to have that with you. He knows everything about you. He knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows better than anyone else the plans that he has for you, the plans to prosper you and not bring you harm, to give you hope and a future like you could never imagine. And that's how much God loves you. That's how much God cares about the relationship that He has with you. He is 100% committed to you. 100% of the time. What is your commitment level to Him? Where would you be if your commitment level to Him, or if His commitment level to you was the same as your commitment level to Him? That's scary, isn't it? You see, when you put your hope and your trust in your faith, in God's ability, there's nothing you can't do. No mountain you can't climb, no victory out of reach, no sickness you can't stand against. There's no limit that he will not go to to help one of his children. Where is your relationship with God this morning? Is it where it should be? Is it where it could be? Draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you, the Bible says. So I challenge you today to take your relationship with the Lord to that next level. You seen a news broadcast lately? There has never been a greater time in the history of our world than to have a closer relationship with the Lord than we do right now. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being that type of God that we need. For being that type of God that just never lets us down. The one who breathes stars loves, loves us. So dear God, as we look upon your power and we look upon our relationship with you, I ask God that you would just always, always let us see the love that holds back your anger. The love that, that channels your power to us. The loving way you take care of us, correct us, guide us. Lord, let us see that everything happens in our lives. You have something to do with. And God, we just pray that we would open up our hearts and our souls. And God, if there's anyone here this morning who has never said, Dear Lord, I want to give my life to you. I look at what I've done with my life and I've messed it up. I want to let you take control of my life. I want to see what you will do with it. Dear Lord, if we pray that if there's someone here thinking those thoughts, Lord, that they wouldn't leave this building without giving their heart and soul to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.